So these first seven are the policy ones. Getting into number eight in the money, the big one gets into the systemic change aspect of this and the idea of, of how do we really get from here to there. And as always, it's focus on the money. Follow the money and you'll see what's really going on. As we all know, it, at this point, Congress is bought and paid for. It's a big money game. That's who they serve. The donors are their constituency, not us. And that's what we're going to have to deal with if, if we're going to make real systemic change. That's the core of it. And so it's just the influence of big money in politics and government. So how can you do that? This reminds me of there is something Caitlin Johnstone said a while back in that she said all of the potential solutions to these big problems are that they're, they're all hard. They're all going to look nearly impossible. And so anything you come up with, people are going to be able to look at that and say, oh, that's, that'll never happen. You know, that's too hard. But if, if we're accepting the challenge and if we're saying that, you know, we, we have to have a working democratic government, then, you know, really the task then I would submit is to choose the least worst option. You know, the, the, the option that has the best chance of succeeding. You know, that's really what you're left with. And so if you're talking about dealing with, with the money, then you get into these options, like at the state and local level, you know, enact uh, ballot measures for clean elections and public financing of campaigns. And that one's far from impossible. Uh, Massachusetts had a uh, clean elections law on, on the books until the legislature and its wisdom uh, wiped it off. <laughs> but it was on there. It can be on there again. And, uh, and of course, that was... Uh originally put into law by by the public the the public of massachusetts in an election ballot question brought that in and then the legislature later on its own nixed that law yep and savvy sabs did a story just recently and they they had a similar situation where they had a ballot initiative an anti-corruption initiative that went through and then the legislature used emergency rules <laughs> to undo it and even undo it like immediately <laughs> and they they just crushed it wow then you got the big boy at the federal level because you're gonna have to deal with the federal level that's where the money is that's where the power is and the the best fix that i've seen at this point is would be a constitutional amendment where you you need to overturn this idea this current status quo in law that money is speech and corporations are people. And so you need a constitutional amendment really to overturn that or else the Supreme Court is going to look very negatively on any type of really good campaign finance laws you pass, whether at the federal or the state level. Corruption, you're gonna to need to deal with corruption. You know, it needs to be investigated, prosecuted. You're gonna to need to deal with revolving door politics where you know you have maybe a softer form of corruption where someone gets in goes from having a job in industry and then to a job in government and if if they get sick of that or if they lose their seat then they go back to industry and a big payout and you get that revolving door that's a big part of the corruption yeah we want to try to as best as possible dismantle the professional political class because that's what you have here mm -hmm. and then transparency is a big one you know, we need to be demanding a radical transparency for all representatives and, and all agencies. Election reform. This is a big one as well, because one of the things I'll hear from well, lefties, I'm sure the righties too, is what's the point of voting? You know, elections are rigged. And um, yeah, there's, I mean, it, it's hard to know for sure how rigged they are. <laughs> But it's, uh, you know, certainly the primaries certainly have big issues. You certainly saw that um, during Bernie's runs. Yeah. You know, there was certainly some pretty clear rigging there. So, you know, so what are we going to do about that? Are we just going to say elections are rigged? What's the point of voting? We're done. Or are we going to demand that the elections not be rigged? And so towards demanding that, you can say your know, demand is make all voting machines and software be open source and auditable by the public. Seems very, very uh, rational. 
you know, when, when you have, when you have an election, it's it's going to get in the computer at some point, right? Even if you have paper ballots, it's yeah. I mean, that cat's out of the bag. It's it's going to be it counted in, in in a computer at some point. We talked about this in a, in another episode a while back. Um, that's another video that people can can check out, or I put it up as a clip. How to fix elections? If you want some more detail on that, and those ideas are on open source and what can be done about it. Um, Ranked choice voting, of course, is a big one. Get rid of the spoiler effect. That can be implemented at even at, that really gets implemented at the state level. I mean, even even federal elections really happen state by state. So you get into ballot initiatives and things like that. It's it's doable. You know, we need to demand it. Definitely. Ballot access is a big one. It's a big part of the problem. It, it, it is hard to get on the ballot, depending on which state you're in and so forth. And it's something that if it's, if it's not happening, if there are things, you know, in where the system's not fair, the bars are too high to get on and things like that, that's where direct action comes in. That's where demanding and getting in the streets and you can demand ballot initiatives. You can be demanding that legislatures pass laws to open up ballot access, but we're going to have to demand it. Another thing that's out there is the good old electoral college put in by the uh, the old slave owning founding fathers. It goes through mostly property owning was the big thing. Of course, yeah. it was the same to them. Yeah. So, and so that, you know, is an obvious one that should be dealt with. But this is one of these cases where you can get into creative ways to deal with this. There's a concept called you know, national popular vote that's been out there where you don't necessarily have to have a constitutional amendment to get rid of the electoral college. It'd be nice. It's the ideal way to do it is to have an amendment. But what you could do is you can have an interstate compact that says if every state agrees that the winner of the popular vote will get all of their electors for the presidency. And if you did that and you get more than 50 percent of the states to agree to that, you've gotten rid of the electoral college because then it you know, practical matters becomes a an election for president based on a popular vote. So, you know, there are creative solutions out there as well that we should be thinking about. Taxation and funding. And of course, that's a big one. There's, this is another one where I'm kind of trying to get into to reaching further. And so you could say, we're gonna abolish all the taxes, except for having a highly progressive tax on income and on large wealth and on large corporations. And that's really how the tax system should run. This idea that you've got a sales tax and tax on every little thing that we do, it's really just a form of wealth distribution. That's really a way to transfer wealth from all of us, the 99%, up to that 0.1%. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I agreed, especially especially on sales tax. I always tell people that homeless people pay sales tax, and it always takes them a second to think about it. And they're like, oh, yeah, got it. And you've talked about the, the complexity of, of the tax law. and Yeah, what we were talking about earlier is that the, ta- the tax law is written not to be user-friendly. And generally speaking, anytime a law is, is made not to be user-friendly, speaking about you just as a member of the general public, it's not there to benefit you. And so... This kind of really large reform and, and changing of, of the tax laws would, of course, be a huge simplification as well. Yes. And, of course, along with that, you're going to have to deal with the loopholes. This idea of that, that people aren't going to abide by it, if the rich aren't not abiding by it, then take away their citizenship. I mean, it's expel them if they're not going to follow the rules of taxation that are for the good of everyone. What I always what I always say on this topic is uh, you need to use the United States market as a weapon. So I don't think like a Jeff Bezos or anything like that would necessarily he might not like it, but I don't I don't think losing his American citizenship would be the end of the road for him. I think you would really need to, to threaten him with losing the American market. That's that's that as well. that's what would hit his bottom line. And then um, another part of this is at the state, local governments, they don't issue their own currency. And so that can also be a pushback against MMT type theory and, and how to deal with things. But you could get creative with that and say, we're going to fund the state and locals on a per person basis with federal dollars. And you could just fund them that way. Right. There's nothing stopping us except the will to do so yeah it's a funny business because the states also do take in a lot of federal dollars so already yeah and again it gets into the simplification and 
things like that. Right. All right, getting down to the end. Number 11, democratize the enterprise. And this is gets into Richard Wolf territory of, um, of trying to reorganize things and supporting worker co-ops. And it, it's the idea of, of really not just saying we should do this, but getting into demanding that we use the power of the federal government and federal funds to, to push this along. I mean, right now, our government's basically hostile to the whole concept of worker-owned co-ops. That's something we need to flip. We need to demand that we have a government that not only isn't hostile to it, but incentivizes things like that, employee-owned and controlled businesses. And there are lots of ways you can do that in terms of financing, corporate rules, you know, things like that. Even as a spot along the way, this next point, you know, you could mandate that publicly traded companies have board seats for employee representation. They, they do things like that in Germany. Even that one's like a pretty low-hanging fruit, really. There's breaking up the monopolies in the large corporations. And then we're talking about companies providing essential services. And when we talk about nationalizing things like YouTube and Twitter and things like that, you can even go beyond nationalizing. You can nationalize and reorganize them as employee-controlled and governed utilities. Yeah, definitely. What it really comes down to is we need to uh, focus away from profit being the main motivator and look at metrics of general public having a high quality of life as what we need to aspire to in this country. Demands. Yeah, demands. Need to have them. Demands. Hold, uh, hold your people up, your elected representatives, hold them up to a high standard and challenge them. So in closing here, what I, what I think we are proposing is that we need to have this, some kind of set of demands to really have it at the core of, of what you call our movement, our philosophy, our principles, because that becomes the guide, that, that becomes the glue that holds things together, that becomes the standard by which you judge candidates and representatives. When you have a, a list of demands like this, when, when you have so-called progressive Democrats like like the squad, it, it's clear that they're not for these demands. Yes. They're not supporting, necessarily not doing anything towards them. Yeah. And so it becomes an easy decision as to whether or not you support Democrats. <laughs> if these are your demands and these are your principles, then then no. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> Right, yeah, and it's it's uh, not not important necessarily where the demands come. I know people have got different ideas. We should be collaborative, um, but the, but the the real point is that when dealing with politics, when dealing with politicians, if we don't have those set of demands, then we're just speaking. 